Welcome to the Defense and Aerospace Report. I'm Vagam Radian here at the Reagan National Defense Forum, America's leading gathering of defense leaders from across the country, whether military, civilian, from industry, or thought leaders. We're here at the Ronald Reagan Presidential, Valley, uh, Presidential Library in Simi Valley, California. Our coverage here is sponsored by Leonardo DRS and L3 Technologies. And we're honored to be talking to General Hawk Carlisle, retired United States Air Force, who heads the National Defense Industrial Association. Sir, it's always a pleasure seeing you. It's good to see you, Vago, as always. I love talking to you. Uh, it's an absolute pleasure. We were talking airplanes. Uh, we're not going to talk airplanes now. We're going to talk a little bit about budgets. Um, you know, we're uh, in a position where uh, Secretary, Deputy Secretary Shanahan had talked about this being a masterpiece budget, the 20 budget that was going to be in the build. Uh, you have gone, you went through many cycles uh, of that throughout your Air Force uh, career. Uh, but now we're looking at uh, a real a real split. Uh, the incoming chairman of the House Armed Services Committee uh, is saying that 700 is likely going to be the ceiling. Jim Inhofe, the uh, chairman of the Senate Armed Services Committee, is talking about uh, you know 733 as a floor. And of course, we have the president now looking at much more of a 700 uh, billion dollar budget. Even though there are appeals, the secretary uh, Mattis and Inhofe and uh, Mac Thornberry are going to meet with uh, the president and Mick Mulvaney next week, apparently to to make their case for more money to lobby right. for more. Money. Right. How do you see this playing out given that your organization re represents the whole piece of contractors across from the air systems all the way to undersea? So it's going to be, I mean, it's going to be a big debate. I think that the challenge is that um, we had a big hole to dig out of. If you think about sequestration, when we went through the BCA, I grounded squadrons. I mean, the entire squadrons in turn whale for 90 days. So we really had to get back to readiness, and, and that was a big hole to, to dig out of. And I, the 18 and 19 were fabulous. They started our move into that, but it's not done. And I think that's the biggest threat is, and that's part of the part that we have to educate Congress and the American people on is we made a good move. We started to reverse the trend where we're climbing out of that readiness and modernization hole. But if we do something drastic in 20 and take 33 billion out of the budget, then all of that work will go for nothing. What we can do is show the American people a receipt that says, hey, you spent this much money and this is how much we've improved, which what Secretary Mattis is asking us all for. And I think that's exactly right. Here's the gains we've made. But if we want to take advantage of these gains and keep them going to do what we need to do, then we've got to keep the budget at that 733 level for 20 and maybe even a little higher as we move our way forward. I think the interesting point that came out a couple of times in the in the day to day is we're at the smallest percent of GDP and the smallest percent of the federal budget that we've been in decades. So we really do have to keep this momentum going forward. Um, from a great power competition standpoint, right, the National uh, Defense Strategy Commission made its report. They're arguing for a trillion dollars, sort of sustain, almost trillion dollars in sustained uh, spending uh, to build those capabilities to back the national defense strategy, which everybody agrees was a good strategy. But um, fiscal reality intervenes. Right. The debt is very, very large. There are concerns that just in a couple of years, the debt, uh, servicing the debt will be bigger than the defense budget. Uh, from that standpoint, it seems that it's going to put a cap on spending. So it's a two-part question. What is it that industry and the government has to do better about making the case to the American people that even though they have a sense that their military is the best in the world, and it is, its relative margin of superiority is decreasing and it's important to invest. So how do you make that case as the first piece? And then I'm going to ask you a tough choices uh, question after. Well, that's a, that's a great point. And I think that is what we have to do. We have to uh, convince the American people that it's the technology edge that has shrunk, has shrunk significantly. When we look at what the Chinese are doing in particular and the Russians to some extent. We know that they're developing at a rapid pace, and we have to stay pace with it. We're not going to cede that ground. We can't as a nation, because we know that they'll change the world order. They'll want it a different way, and they won't believe in our liberties and freedoms in the way that the world order that we've established since we won in, in World War II. So we have got to convince them of the, of the capabilities that we have to have. And then the next thing is capacity. And, and the fact that we do this all over the world is critical to this. It's not, we don't just, you know, it's not just the South China Sea, it's not just Europe, it's not just uh, Latin America, it's not just the Middle East, it's the whole world. And so our ability capacity-wise to execute across the globe is what we really have to convince the American people of. Um, one of the things that everybody here has been talking about is tough choices. Corey Shockey uh, of the International Institute for Strategic Studies told us that, look, you know, innovation is also about what you don't do, not just what you're going to be doing new. Right, right. And that 
will mean repercussions industrially, for right. example. Uh, I'm not trying to predicate it, but let's say we don't need a certain kind of combat aircraft or we don't need a certain kind of ship. Each one of these has very powerful constituencies right. that, are, that are behind them. Ultimately, what are some ways that I know that these kind of conversations are ongoing? to incentivize industry because each one of these is publicly traded companies. So they have a fiduciary responsibility to sell their program, even if it may not necessarily be the right program at the end of the day. What are some ways that or conversations that you're having with the department to figure out, hey, look, if we start to make these large shifts, how do we sort of incentivize folks to sort of, okay, there's going to be the next thing that we're moving to, you know, even though it's a, you know, potentially, potentially complicated politically, uh, industrially, and militarily to make some of these decisions? Well, I, you know, I mean, that's uh, it's a million-dollar question, right? If I had the answer to that, I'd be doing a different job, I think, uh, when you think about it, because there is a constituency, and in fact, you can always build an argument for those, because across the board, you probably need them, depending on the scenario and what you're going to do. What I really think we have to do is you got to rack and stack. you got to get a priority in it, great power competition. If you think of Russia, China, you look at North Korea and I Iran, and then violent extremism, you go, okay, we got priorities. And what does it take in those realms? And if you start with great power competition and go down. And the systems that apply to that are the ones that you have to be cognizant of and the ones that you have to really uh, uh, build for and the ones you have to advocate for. Um, but you're right, how do you incentivize the folks that you're going to say, okay, we're not going to do that part of it anymore? And that part of that is partnerships with bigs, uh, you know, competitors as they call them, or frenemies, whatever word you want to use, is, is how do you build their, their success into the success of those priorities at the same time? And again, that's not an easy thing to do, especially when you include then the congressional piece of it, because there's huge constituencies inside the Congress that's going to want to keep things going. Try, I mean, just look at us today. Try to retire a fleet of airplanes. It's difficult. Um, so I think those are the things. But if we can build the partnerships, uh, if we can build foreign military sales and direct commercial sales as part of that, that's another part where we're trying to help. And that security cooperation is a big avenue for defense industry to earnings per share and take care of their stockholders. So that's another incentivize is how do you keep those going and actually grow those a little bit. Um, let me ask you one last question, and it's on cyber. Um, you know, there have been so many penetrations uh, of capability. Even some of the most top secret programs have been compromised. Russian and Chinese intruders have, have resided in American systems for, for disproportionately long periods of time. What's the right, and, and how is the industry thinking about this? I mean, obviously, the department is looking at a whole bunch of new rules, regulations. Uh, the Congress has a new initiative on cyber. I know a couple of friends of mine are on both publicly acknowledged and not acknowledged uh, groups right. to work this issue. Um, it, is this something that's going to take a lot more investment, a lot more planning to shut all of these doors, and that the whole ecosystem has to be comfortable that this may cost a lot more money than anybody is anticipating at this point. I don't. I, I think it's an evolution over time. I mean, part of it, you know, the fact of the matter is, a lot of times, and, and this is an education and an evolution. A lot of times, the problems are cyber hygiene, people just not changing their passwords, or using one, two, three, four, five, six. You know, so there, there's more we can do. We got to build it into the into our into our being of what cyber is, and everybody's looking, everybody's trying to get in. And a lot of that can be solved by that. I think the government's got to help. I think, you know, especially with the mediums and smalls, big's got, you know, they're, they're pretty good at being able to d defend their networks, but they don't know what their third and fourth tier suppliers are. And those third and fourth tier are often small, medium or small business, and they may not have the wherewithal. That's why I think go government furnished capability may be a requirement as we go in there. And then I think that, you know, we got to prioritize. If you protect everything, you protect nothing, right? So the priority's got to be, you know, an F-35 radar or an Aegis uh, missile system is pretty important. So I think we need to go all scale out on that. If you're looking at just a standard bomb rack, maybe that's less of a factor. Maybe you don't have to put as much security into that one. So I think the other thing that the government owes to industry is how do you prioritize and where do you put your most effort to make sure those systems are protected? And then the lesser ones you know are going to be attacked, but you can deal with those a little bit easier. Uh, last quick question. Ellen Lord is still looking at good ideas from folks. Mike Griffin is also uh, looking at changing the acquisition system fundamentally. Uh, the two are still working together and, and still refining how they're going to be working together ultimately. But what do you hope is going to come out of this new effort in terms of streamlining the system and accelerating it? Well, the biggest hope is we get rid of the valley of death. 
I, I, what I really would like to see is a way that between Dr. Griffin and Ellen Lord, they can come together as you do rapid prototyping. We've got the authorities to do that, OTAs, uh, rapid capabilities office, things like that, where you develop technology rapidly and you get it there. And then once you go, hey, this, this technology works, it scales, it's ready to go, then you have a way to move it into a program or record and field it rapidly so you get the capability in the warfighter's hands fastly. Kessel Run, the agile computer software programming work, is an example of that. So what you really hope between ANS and r and &E is that uh, ANS understands what r and &E's doing, r and &E goes, hands it over and goes, hey, this is ready to go, and then you can scale it and you can get in a program or record and not wait five years to get in a program or record, get in program record rapidly. Retired United States Air Force General Hawk Carlisle, who heads the National Defense Industrial Association, NDIA. Sir, it's always a pleasure. Thanks uh, very much for the time. I love talking to you, Vago. It's always good to be around you. Thanks, buddy.